For a while now, I've had those monocrystalline solar cells laying around. And by adding a bit of flux to them, we can solder a so-called solar tapping wire to its front and back side. And measure a voltage potential between both sides. Now of course, the low voltage of one cell is not sufficient to power anything useful. That is why commercial solar panels, like this 100 watt one, puts a lot of those cells, 36 to be specific, in series in order to create a voltage of 19.35 volts, a short circuit current of 5.53 amps and a maximum power of 100 watts. The only problem with such commercial solar panels is that they are not very cheap. But on the other hand, you can get 40 individual solar cells for half the price of the commercial panel and simply combine 36 of them to get a 100 watt panel as well. So in this episode of DIY or buy, let's find out what goes into creating a solar panel by making a DIY version. And in the end, let's evaluate which version was cheaper. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB. One fact about them. JLC PCB boards are widely used in the industrial, aerospace and medical fields as well as DIY projects. Upload your Gerber files to order high quality PCBs for low prices. To start off, I got myself aluminum U-channels with those dimensions. Out of them, I wanted to create the frame of the solar panel. So I got myself a miter saw, set its angle to 45 degrees and created two 131cm pieces and two 61cm long pieces from the U-channels. This task was certainly a bit exhausting, but after half an hour and a bit of rust treatment for the sharp edges, I got my four frame pieces. Next I connected two pieces one after the other to form the four edges of the frame and used a bracket on them to mark the necessary mounting holes. After then drilling the holes with a 6.5mm drill bits, I formed the frame by utilizing the brackets, M5 screws, washers and self-locking nuts. Once that was done, I added paper towels to my work surface, because it was about to get messy due to the mineral adhesive that I used. But before that, I properly cleaned the aluminum frame and brought in a 3mm thick piece of clear plexiglass with dimensions of 130 by 60 cm. And after removing its protective film on one side, it was time to utilize the mirror adhesive by adding a thick line of it all around the frame. I made sure to use a lot of the adhesive, since the seal has to be waterproof later on. But anyway, as soon as that was done, I carefully pressed the plexiglass in its frame. Which was a bit messy at first, but after doing some cleanup with additional adhesive, it did not look that terrible. And while the adhesive was drying, it was time to prepare the 36 solar cells. For that, I grabbed my soldering iron set to 350 degrees Celsius and followed the now stated rules for the soldering technique. Add flux to the white lines on the front side of the cell. Connect the solar tapping wire to the white lines by soldering it to them. Make sure to keep the wire straight and flat with the surface. Leave a length of about another solar cell of the tapping wire before cutting it. Repeat this process 36 times and try to not lose your mind while doing so. And just like that, you can get 4 piles with 9 wired up solar cells each which we will need for the frame, whose adhesive should be dry by now. That means I removed the second protective film of the plexiglass and started placing the solar cells onto it. The first row requires 9 cells with the wires facing to the left. The following rows though will always need the wires facing the opposite direction than the row before. This way we can later connect all the cells in a snake formation to create a long series connection. And according to the scheme, I placed the remaining cells onto the plexiglass 
and fine adjusted their position to get a similar distance between all the cells. The next step was once again tedious, by tinning the backside pads of the cells and soldering the overlapping frontside wires to them. This represents the series connections in the rows, which means all in all I had to do 34 of those. But nevertheless, once that was done, we should be able to measure a higher voltage between the front and back cell of each row, which was in fact true. That means we can move on by adding solar tapping wire to the remaining cells and utilizing thicker bus wire to create the series connections in between the rows. Thankfully though, there were only three of them, and after adding a longer bus wire to the middle point of the cells, and double checking that all voltages at the main terminals were present, it was time to seal the deal. For that, I got myself this epoxy resin, but before trying this method on the bigger solar panel, I created myself a small foam plastic container, placed a single solar cell inside it, and filled it up with the mixed up resin. After waiting for a day, the resin hardened and the end results looked pretty decent. The solar cell did also not crack due to the pressure, which was important, and also still worked without any problems. That means it was time for me to mix up a bigger batch of the resin and slowly cover all the 36 solar cells with it. It took me a total of around 3 kilograms of the resin but in the end, all solar cells were completely covered in it. And as soon as the resin was hard, I added two bypass diodes between the three terminals, just like the commercial panel does it. If you're interested in what the function of those diodes is, then definitely have a look at my basics video about solar panels and charge controllers. Anyway, after I cleaned up the panel, I drilled two holes in the side of it, pushed two 6 square millimeter wires through it and soldered those to the positive and negative terminal of the DIY panel. After then covering the terminals with duct tape, I lifted up the old commercial solar panel on my garage, drilled two holes through its frame as well, positioned the DIY panel on the roof and pushed its solar wires into the commercial one and also afterwards through my roof PVC pipe. After then reattaching the commercial solar panel to the roof with bitumen and mounting the DIY panel near its edges, it was finally time to connect the DIY panel to the solar charge controller, which reveals a power harvest of 59 watts. That is the exact amount of power that the commercial panel also delivered a few seconds later. That basically means that my DIY panel, according to the power outputs, was a success and thus by connecting the two panels to the charge controller, we can get a power output of above 100 watts easily. But if we add the costs of all the components, we would get a price of approximately 140 euros for a 100 watt panel, while not even counting the time it takes to create it. Also, I highly doubt that my design will survive the elements as long as the commercial one and probably also features worse heat transfer characteristics. The only meaningful use for such a DIY panel would be when you have to create an oddly shaped solar panel, but for everything else I would recommend the buy version, which is also the winner of this episode. If you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Stay creative and I will see you next time!